Good morning. I want to thank Brother Rose for that introduction. There's so many people I want to thank. Um, I want to thank the organizers of this conference. Uh, I want to give a special thanks to Camilo, who just made sure that everything worked for me. Um, I want to thank Brother David Gomes, who I'll come back to in a second. Um, and uh, the, the Unity House and the Labor Center. And, and this has been, it's really wonderful being back in New England. Um, I want to, uh, I also want to thank um, the late Jose Soler. Um, <laughs> Jose and I uh, became good friends. He was always looking out for me and um, made it possible for me to be here, this campus, several times. And uh, I, to this day, really can't get over that he's gone. Um, and his, his passing, in part, is wa a part of is partly why, when I encounter COVID deniers, I become homicidal. Because I've known six people who died because of the plague. So when I hear these characters talk about, well, you know. I don't need to get a vaccine, this is all made up. I mean, my response is really to want to go for their throat because I think about Jose. And I think about we'd be in a better place if Jose was with us today. And so I just wanted to pay tribute to him. I want to, I want to thank uh, Brother Rose. Um, as he mentioned, I have two novels uh, that take place in southeastern Massachusetts. And... Um, and one of them, uh, in both of them, the main character happens to be named uh, David Gomes, um, which our brother here never ceases to remind me about the connection, and that I somehow, uh, you know, took that and, and, and got it uh, into my head to name my, my main character. But I also want to thank uh, Brother Rose. When I was writing, uh, uh, constructing the idea for the second novel, The Man who changed colors, which will be on sale, by the way, uh, that's a little plug, uh, today at 6 o'clock, um, I called him to get a better sense of New Bedford in the 1970s. And without him, uh, I, I wouldn't have been able to construct this story. And so I really want to thank you, bro. So I realized that we're running a little late. Um, and so um, I'm from New York anyway, so I'm going to talk fast. Um, but I, I want to say some things, and then I want to make sure we have time for a little back and forth before uh, the next panel. Organized labor, no, let me back up. In the United States, we actively oppose history and embrace myth. And we see this regularly, that any time there's something in US history that makes some people uncomfortable, and I'm not going to mention the name of the governor of Florida or the former president of the United States, but any time that something is mentioned that makes people uncomfortable, they want to sweep it aside and replace it with myth. And this is something that we see time and again, and it's not simply uh, conservatives and fascists that do that, but even people in our own ranks that have great difficulty coming to grips with the complexity of history, the contradictions that one sees in history, and what the implications are, and also having difficulty addressing erased populations. Um, so we end up developing these myths. For example, there's been a, for a long time a certain myth about the construction of the so-called labor movement in the United States, uh, which looks like a straight line from the 1830s to today, is mainly white, and every so often those of us of color are invited in as guests, and, and it's completely wrong. Yet it is regurgitated again and again and again, and I'm going to get back to that. So 
in order to understand the problems that labor has today, we have to understand that by and large, it doesn't accept history and it doesn't study history. So problem number one, it, it fails to make the distinction between the labor movement and the trade union movement and looks at the two as the same, and they're not. That if you want to understand the labor movement, you have to understand class struggle. To understand class struggle, you have to understand capitalism. It wasn't like the first there was capitalism and then there was class struggle. With the development of capitalism, you have class struggle. Classes compete, they fight. They fight over surplus. They, take, they have various forms of fighting. In other words, the labor movement originates with the formation of capitalism. And if you read this fantastic book, it reads like a novel, The Many-Headed Hydra by uh, Leinbarger and Redeker. One of the things that's fascinating is you see in the development of North, Amer uh, North Atlantic capitalism, the various forms of organization that workers take, including, and this was really new to me, piracy, right? That pirates formed republics, but they also formed organizations that were actually quite democratic on their ships, and that they were revolting against mercantile capitalism. It was the labor movement. And this labor movement was, interestingly, not what you saw in the pirate movies from the 30s and 40s, these, uh, it, 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 you know, where it was just these white men. It turns out that this labor movement, which went by the name of piracy, included complete diversity, Europeans, Africans, Indians, men and women. And some of the captains of these pirate ships were women. You never see that in most histories or in most movies. That was the origins of the labor movement. When indentured servants were forced, were kidnapped from Europe and from Africa and brought to North America, they didn't come voluntarily. Most of them didn't. It wasn't mainly about people like on the uh, the Mayflower or coming to jo uh, Jam uh, Jamestown or, or others. It was mainly forced labor. People picked up, grabbed. The so-called paupers of Europe and of Britain picked up and brought to North America to work for a mandatory seven years be before they could become free. Africans were brought here as indentured servants, yes, as indentured servants and as slaves. In the beginning, it was primarily indentured servants, right? Brought over here. They didn't come voluntarily. They didn't go down to the Atlantic to book passage to New York. They were grabbed, right, and brought here. And they found themselves in the 1600s immediately immersed in class struggle. Immediately. It wasn't like down the road. Immediately. The fight was on with the plantation owners, with the merchants, with the shipbuilders, and others. They were engaged in this constant battle against oppression, sometimes separately, i.e. European or African, but a lot of times together. And there were various so-called bond servant revolts, the other name for indentured servants, that were European and African together. And it scared the bejeebies out of the British. And the British had to figure out, I'm only going to focus on North America because I don't have time to get into Latin America. But the British, it scared the bejeebies out of them because there were more of the poor than there were of the rich, as there always are. And the question was, what do you do to ensure that the rich remain hegemonic? And the British went back and forth. How do we divide these populations up? They first tried uh, introducing religion, particularly w corresponding with the introduction of racial slavery or with slavery. And they said that the only people that could be enslaved were non-Christians. And because my people, because Africans are not stupid, they said, give me the Bible. <laughs> I mean, this is, this is an easy one, right? Give me the Bible. <clears throat> well, that didn't really succeed. The British then introduced color. And the construction of race and racism although it originated in Ireland with the British oppression of Ireland and of the indigenous Irish, which many Irish Americans don't know or they don't want to know, um, as well as what the Spanish and the Portuguese did in the Iberian Peninsula, what the British introduced here was the one-drop rule, 
which was that one drop of African blood and you were black, therefore you could be made a slave. The Spanish and the Portuguese, for a whole set of other reasons, which I wish we had time to go into, do not introduce the one drop rule. They introduce another method of social control, and the Spanish called it las castas. Um, but the British introduced the one drop rule. So immediately, you have this division of the populations, but you also introduce something else which is very, very important, gun ownership. Not only white people could own guns and use them, and they had to use them, and they often had to own them because they had to be enlisted into militias to push back and exterminate the indigenous and into slave patrols to stop the Africans from revolting against racial slavery. Thus, gun ownership equals white, white equals gun ownership, which helps to explain the fanaticism of gun ownership in the United States compared with other countries that have more guns, right, or use guns uh, 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 frequently. I don't mean use them to commit crimes. Places like Sweden, where it's like people have guns, but they're not using them, they're not worshiping them the way that they are worshipped here. They worship here because it's connected to whiteness. Even when you have people of color that, uh, that embrace them, fundamentally. So we have this division that was introduced by the oppressor to split those at the bottom. And that labor movement that had originated with development of capitalism also starts to splinter along what we would understand to be racial lines. Now, one little anecdote about this that I always uh, love telling is about the 1741 slave conspiracy in the colony of New York. And, and what was unique about this in, in the 1700s was that it was Africans and Irish who were joining together to carry out excuse me, this insurrection. So as frequently happens when slaves get together, there's a spy, a handkerchief head, as my parents would say, that basically revealed the story. So everyone gets arrested. And before they get executed, they get interrogated. And so they asked the Africans, what was the objective of the slave revolt, of this revolt? And they said to kill all the white people. Well, there's really no surprise there, right? So then they asked the Irish, well, what was your objective in this slave revolt? And they said to kill all the white people. Now, this is really remarkable. 1741, and the Irish are identifying the oppressor as white. Now, I've been to Ireland. I see what they look like, and I know that they are not very dark, which meant that the issue of whiteness was not about skin color. It was an identification with a group of oppressors. A hundred years later, in the aftermath of the potato famine, you don't have Irish making those same claims. And to this day. So the working class ends up being successfully divided up. Now, the second thing I want to raise is that the construction of a racial settler state has completely deformed class struggle in the United States. We have this really bizarre situation where you can have very militant white trade unionists deeply committed to unions, deeply committed to fighting uh, capitalists, who are just as deeply committed to a white supremacist vision of the country. And you saw this in the, um, in the 18, 1900s, 19th century. One of the premier leaders of the maritime unions, Andrew Firth, um, if you read any of his writings, sometimes you think the guy's a Marxist until he goes on a rant against the, the yellow peril from Asia and about the need to protect white workers and a white population. Because you see, part of what happens the success of what the British put into place and what Euro-Americans continued, the Euro-American elite continued, was this identification that there was a white republic and everyone else was on the outside of that. So you could have class struggle within the white republic as long as that class struggle did not fundamentally challenge the white republic. And the class struggle within the white republic could not include the other those of us that were outside of the parameters of the white republic. 
This then leads to a real deformation of what emerges as a trade union movement. Because the trade union movement arises in the 1830s, 1840s. It's a white movement. It's men and women, sometimes segregated by gender, other times together. But from its inception, it conceptualizes itself as a white movement. Read again the white republic. It's a white movement within a white republic for white workers. And so when folks look at, when, when today current organized labor looks at the history of organized labor and they don't go back to si the 1600s, they make a fundamental mistake which has an impact on how we understand history and how we understand strategy. So deformation of the class struggle. The, um, so in the, 18, uh, in the aftermath of the Civil War, you could tell I could go on for a little while. In the aftermath of the Civil War, this white trade union movement has a dilemma because there's all of these freed Africans running around, right? And what should the white trade union movement do? In addition, you have all of these Chinese on the West Coast who are building railroads and mines and agriculture, et cetera. What should they do? And the... African uh, 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 workers and the, the Chinese go to organized labor, the white low organized labor, and they seek a partnership. And they get rejected. African, freed Africans in the South choose to organize on their own in part as a response. And between 1866 and 1868, what you see is a proliferation of what we would now call wildcat strikes that take place in plantation after plantation by black workers. And it's successful. And this is during the period of the Reconstruction. White labor did not, in, in its failure to understand race, did not understand the significance of Reconstruction and did not understand the significance of these black workers that were organizing in the South and kept them at arm's length and even did something that was so um, unbelievably insulting of saying to black workers, we're not going to let you into our unions, but we want you to join with us to reject the Republican Party and form a labor party. Now, as I said, people of African descent aren't stupid. We make mistakes, but we aren't stupid. And when you're confronted with that, you're not going to let me into a union, but you're going to say we should abandon the party that's leading Reconstruction and do what? And, and so that was obviously rejected. And, and so you, you have the development of independent trade union movements following the Civil War. And they often break down on racial lines. Sometimes they don't. The Knights of Labor, which included whites and, uh, and uh, Chicanos or Mexican-Americans and Africans, but did not include uh, Asians, right, was, was one uh, episode. But there were also independent groups. There was a colored national labor union that was formed as a response to the national labor union rejecting workers of color, and it was open to all. You see this through the rest of the 19th century, independent Mexican, or what we call now Mexican-American, labor formations developing. You saw in the early part of the 20th century, the development of the industrial workers of the world, which was open to everybody and was, was vehemently anti-racist and refused to allow into its ranks segregated uh, unions. So we see that, we see this splintering, this, this, the, the looking at labor history, it's not like a straight line. There are these different tendencies that were going on. And this question of who is the legitimate working class of the United States and who should be organized. And within our ranks, we've always had bitter differences about that question. In the mid, uh, uh, around 1905, there was a labor formation on the West Coast called the Japanese Mexican Labor Association, which was made up of Japanese and Mexican workers, no surprise. And they were very successful in organizing. And they decided that they wanted to affiliate with the American Federation of Labor. And so they sent a letter requesting affiliation. And Samuel Gompers, who is heralded as the father 
of the AFL and of our contemporary labor movement responded with a letter that basically was directed to the Mexicans and said, get rid of the Japs and we'll let you in. And the Japanese American labor, uh, I've always said, and I'll continue until I'm elected, um, I've, I've said when I become the president of the AFL-CIO, that I will make sure in the lobby, the letter from the Japanese Mexican Labor Association will be right there as the first thing that people will see when they enter those doors. It basically, see, if, the, if, they, if it had been a letter from New York, as opposed to from California, it would have been a much briefer letter. Um, and it would have told Gompers where to go and at what rate of speed and what to do when he got there. This very eloquent and basically said, you take all of us in or none of us in. Um, so our movement has always been split over this question of who is legitimate, who is not, and whose history is important. Now, in the interest of time, let me just uh, say this last piece. The history of workers of color has been largely, up until the 1970s, was largely erased from labor history. When Philip Foner wrote Organized Labor and the Black Worker, it was pathbreaking. It opened up a whole series of discussions about things that people had never heard about. Um, and, and, and I want to just give one example because of the recent UAW strike, strikes. In the 1930s, the uh, United Auto Workers was formed, and they started organizing uh, the, the auto industries, and they were very successful in GM and Chrysler, but they weren't successful in Ford until 1941. Now, I don't know how many of you know this story. They weren't successful because, see, Henry Ford, in addition to being a virulent anti-Semite and fascist, which he was, I mean, that's not like euphemism, um, he was brilliant at divide and conquer. And so one of the things that he did was that he hired black workers into auto plants. And he hired them through black ministers in Detroit. So he basically set up a sort of patronage operation where in order to get a job in Ford, you had to go through a minister. And that meant you had to kiss that minister's rear in order to get in there. And so you see where that goes. Ford also understand, understood PR, and he offered uh, facilities to George Washington Carver, scientific facilities, and so used that to basically say, you know, I'm a really good guy. And the UAW could not break into Ford. 1941, the UAW united with the National Negro Congress and NAACP, and that was when they won. I have asked UAW members for years, how many of you know this story? No one. No one. Nada. Right? Not one person knows that story. And even in progressive ranks within the UAW, people don't know that story. And it's like interesting. So what ends up happening is there's a narrative that's articulated that erases us. We're irrelevant. We're just the beneficiaries of some good white people doing something for us, as opposed to, no, damn it, there would be no damn union if it weren't for us. There would have been no CIO if it wasn't for us, if it wasn't for Chicanos, if it wasn't for African Americans, if it wasn't for Asians. And that's what we have to keep remembering. We are not sidelined. We're not an appendage. We're not an asterisk. We are central to the sentence, right? It, it would not be here if it wasn't for us. And so today, when we're looking at the future of organized labor, we've got to be thinking not about how do we convince good white people to do things for us. We of color have to figure out how do we construct, reconstruct a labor movement using our own eyes and bringing other people along. You know, I can't tell you how many times I've been in a room in labor where when it comes to talking about black folks, they'll look at me. Well, Bill, what do you think? Or when it's race, Bill, what do you think? Okay, well, that's real nice. But, but ask me about strategy. 
Ask me about tactics. Ask me about alliances. Don't marginalize me. And I actually have ideas about where labor should be going. Don't say, well, wait a minute. We good white people are going to come up with the ideas, and then when we've got it all together, then we're going to call you to just add your signature. No way, right? It is going to be a different route. I had this discussion with some people in the Coalition of Black Trade Unionists a few years ago who were basically, you know, there was some discussions in the AFL-CIO about where labor should go. And so in the CBTU, people said, well, we got to really talk about, you know, the importance of the black workers. I said, oh, hold it, time out, right? Why? Why? Why aren't we talking about where labor should go? Why is it that we're saying someone else should figure out where labor goes, and we just like sort of like silly putty, you know, just get attached to it? Why aren't we the ones that are saying, no, 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 no. We're going to be central to the development of strategy. You're going to sit down and talk with us about strategy, not just about the people of color, not just about race, but about where this movement should go and what it should look like. And even among us, there was a discomfort because we're so used to being erased, so used to being marginalized, that when you say, no, we are central and we have to insist it, people start vibrating. Those are our challenges, or at least some of them. And if I had another hour, I could keep going. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think we have a few minutes for questions and comments. And so, and that, this is the part that I love. As long as you don't give a speech, I'm the only one that can give a speech. Yes, over here. Thank you very much. And one of the things that, that I'm glad you raised this, one of the things that uh, any good organizer uh, will tell you is that you go into a place and it's the women of color who respond first. And it's the women of color that are the core. And, and because of male supremacy, what we often have is something where it's the guys that end up being in the leadership positions and, and, and again, this is one of the ways that we often internalize oppression, where even women will say, no, no, it really should be a guy that, that runs this. Now, that's less so now than it was once upon a time, but that struggle continues. So thank you for raising this. Other questions or comments? Oh, yeah, back there. Okay, so we're going to cancel lunch. Um, <laughs> and the next panel, forget it. Um, so, so right now, we face this incredible danger of what some people call post-fascism. Some people call it simply right-wing authoritarianism. But a really, really incredible danger and it's not just about Donald Trump. It's about a movement that is coalescing. It's been coalescing for a while. And, and it's a movement that's rooted in the history of the United States. Right-wing populism, as I like to describe it, is the herpes of capitalism. And it's, it gets in the system, and at certain points it manifests itself when the system weakens. And we've been going through that for quite a while. Uh, this manifestation with all of its ugliness. 
Um, and part of what's central to the right-wing authoritarian narrative is the resuscitation of the white republic and, and essentially that um, either literally picking, p kicking people out of the country, as Trump is talking about once again, right, or creating and or creating a system that looks very much like apartheid South Africa, where there is a racial um, uh, pyramid. And this becomes very important because I've, you know, I've been trying to figure out, like at different points, when I'm, you know, some of these right-wing groups and you have people with like Spanish last names or um, black. <clears throat> I'm saying like, what planet do you come? Like, did you come from another parallel dimension or something? Uh, and what I realize is that there are segments of the right that are willing to allow people of color in, including leadership positions, as long as they don't challenge the racial pyramid. So as long as they're prepared to acknowledge white supremacy, there is a place for them. And that's what you saw in South Africa, where you had white at the top, and then you had um, the uh, honorary whites, then you had uh, like South Asians, coloreds, and blacks. And so we're headed down that route. So if you don't understand race, people can get suckered into this. So part of what we've got to do, Aaron, is we've got to do serious educational work. And <clears throat> many of our leaders are simply cowardly. Uh, they, I mean, just, they are. Um, and they refuse to take this on directly. So taking on the far right is not just about how bad Trump is. It's about understanding the narrative that's being spun. Let me give you this one example. And before the 2016 election, this guy that was a, a friend of mine was working with some Teamsters. And he showed me this letter from a Teamster member to the leader of his local. And the, the guy said he was not going to vote for Clinton. Uh, and he went on to talk about how bad si the situation is and that he had to vote for his son's future. And therefore, he was voting for Trump. And I look at this letter and I said, wow. So basically what you're saying, you're looking for the future of your son on my back. Right? And that's cool with you. And that's, remember when I said the racial settler colonial setup, it completely deformed class struggle because this was a militant trade unionist seeing himself as supporting his union and active in his union and saw no contradiction between that and supporting a white supremacists. And that's part of the discussion that we've got to have with our members. And a lot of people aren't going to like it. And I've been talking to union leaders a lot who refuse to come to grips with that and have not, did not want to talk about January 6th. Because it opens up, see, when you're, when you're cowardly you've, and you don't want to talk about things, eventually it's sort of like trying to keep a bubble underwater. Eventually it comes up, but not necessarily where you want it to come up. And that's what's happened with us. Vaughn. Mm hmm So now you're really not going to have lunch. Um, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say, Vaughn, I'd, uh, I wouldn't agree with your general point. I wouldn't say that that's the left. I'd say it's broader. It's a broader progressive movement that that division that you cited is, is real. And I think part of it is certainly at the leadership of organized labor, they can't conceive an alternative to capitalism. So 
and this goes, I, I mean, you, you see this clearly articulated in Samuel Gompers. Gompers himself had been a socialist, but at a certain point he gives up the idea of socialism and, and says, no, this is the best it's going to be. We're just going to try to fight it out to get the best deal we can within these parameters. That's one camp. The other camp that was represented by the industrial workers of the world, represented by the left and the CIO and others, said, no, actually capitalism is the problem. We may not be able to terminate it soon, but we have to understand that it is fundamentally the problem. And as such, it, has, it sets certain constraints and there's constant pushback on every victory that we win. So I would say that um, these forces may not be able to unite. We may have to ideologically defeat those that okay. think capitalism is cool okay, and that there, there's no alternative, uh, win them over. Um, that, that's one thing. But I think that we, it, it has to be done on the basis of constructing an alternative view about where labor and the progressive movement need to go. We need to be thinking not just about defeating the bad guys, but of introducing an alternative view of economics and politics so that when we're running for office, whether it's a mayor, governor, or whatever else, we're not just running to kick the rear of some, uh, you know, some negative person. We're saying to our base and broader, there's a different vision for the way the city could be run. There's a different vision for how the state can be run. Um, and let me just give you one example since I am out of time. So I was giving a, a, a talk in Texas a few years ago. And I always like to tell people about this because um, you know, I was invited to talk about something. And during the Q&A, people are coming to me and saying, they're telling me how bad the situation was in Texas. Say, oh, this, this, and this is before Abbott, right? <clears throat> and said, this is going, this is bad, this is bad. So I listened. And so then I, I turned it around and I said, um, how do we take over Texas? And they, and it was stunned. There was the silence. And they started looking at me as if I had just like smoked some weed, right? And, and, and I said, no, I'm serious. How do we take over Texas? You're telling me how bad the situation is. I get it. I didn't just parachute in. But what are we going to do about it? What, what are we try what's our counterattack strategy? I, I don't want to hear moaning and groaning. I'm sick of that. I am so sick and tired of hearing about how bad it is. I sometimes just turn the TV off, and I sometimes turn people off because I'm tired of hearing how bad it is unless you're going to tell me what the hell are we going to do. And so I said, so in Texas, which are the key cities that we have to win? Which are the key counties? Which counties can we ignore? Which are the key social movements? Who are the key opinion makers? What are the radio and TV stations that we need to influence? Let's map, up a, map out a battle plan. On December 8, 1941, I would put a dollar to a donut that the Joint Chiefs of Staff were not sitting around. Is this being recorded, by the way? No. Because I'm no. getting ready to say something. I just. No. No? no. Oh, okay, good. So on December 8th, I'm from. Are we going to surrender? I can't believe that they would have been doing that. What would they have been doing? They'd say, we just got our asses kicked in Pearl Harbor yesterday. Now, what do we do? How do we turn that around? What's the strategy? Let's start working out the strategy to kick the ass of the Japanese. That's what they would have been doing. That's not what we do. We sit around complaining until the cows come home about how we're getting our asses kicked. Right about what Trump is doing, DeSantis is doing, Haley is doing, all these other people, the mag is this, the mag is that, right? What are we doing to kick their ass? How are we trying to turn the tables? The Joint Chiefs of Staff ultimately came up with this interesting strategy which has great relevance to us. <clears throat> the, the U.S. On the, in the Pacific was on the defensive. They kept losing. They knew that they were going to keep losing. They lost the Philippines, they lost uh, Wake, other places. They came up with this idea. It was called Doolittle's Raid. So in April 1942, secretly trained US pilots took off from these aircraft carriers. They were actually too far from Japan than they had anticipated. And they went 
to Japan and bombed Tokyo, Yokohama, and one other city, I can't remember, right? Now, the military value of this was negligible. The damage was of really little significance. But what it did is it shook the Japanese into their souls. And because Japan was supposed to be invulnerable. They had been telling the people, we don't have to worry. And then these US planes come and bomb their, their cities. And then the Japanese did exactly what they shouldn't have done. They attacked Midway. And the US had gotten the secret codes of the Japanese, and they kicked the ass of the Japanese in Midway, killed the most important admiral, Yamamoto. And from that point on, the Japanese never advanced. It was all downhill. What did the US do? They derailed the strategy of the other side, and they created confusion and dismay on the other side. The right wing always does it to us. When the hell are we going to do it to them? Thank you. Thank you.